G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle, and today I want to talk about writing your own backstories and fluff, uh, your own lore for your forces. The reason I bring this up is I've been seeing a lot of really atrocious fanfiction lately, and I thought I'd share some of mine, possibly atrocious fanfiction, talk about what I do and don't like about it, and then um, try and go from there with a few sort of rules or concepts I think we should apply when making our own fluff. So, I'll read to you my short fluff and you can decide whether you like it or not for yourself and then we'll go into some specifics. Now, the story is about what I call the Temple Fleet and it's a set of essentially 30k period Black Templars made up of people who were in this sort of Templar order of the Imperial Fists. And they're all survivors of the Battle of Fell, and they've reverted to their pre-dawn colour scheme. I may be able to even chuck some pictures up right now, so you can see what they actually look like. Okay, cool. So, the tale of the Temple Fleet is both inspiring and tragic. Their story began with the Battle of Fell, the immense void conflict fought between the Imperial Fists and the Iron Warriors. In the heat of battle, the Imperial Fists led a massive strike on the flagship of Perturabo himself, before a message from Rogel Dawn reached them, immediately recalling the fleet. During these moments, the warships that would eventually form the core of the Temple Fleet bore down on Perturabo before they were called off. They wheeled about and sought the jump points on the edge of the system. Battered, demoralised, they did manage to escape. The survivors, however, were changed. The fleet felt they had failed. They had failed to reach Terra. They had failed to kill Perturabo. They had failed to defeat the Iron Warrior fleet. Among them were many members of the Temple, and their creed of honour and duty resounded with the demoralised members of the fleet. Their commander, Hector Brusilov, ordered the fleet to change their armour scheme. He had fought in the time before dawn, and feeling that they were not worthy of him, they would revert their colours to before this time. Their scheme, the yellow right arm and the bare silver grey ceramite for the rest. They would keep their iconography, for they were still fists, but they would have to earn their colours back, and from this point on, the fleet was to be an aggressor, to stand against the forces of Horus, striking behind their lines, attacking their ships and assisting other forces in planetary campaigns. At various points, they were thought to be black shields, but at their heart, they never lost sight of their parent legion, and their allegiance never wavered. They fought amongst the scars, with the Dark Angels of Causeway, a force whose knightly virtues of honour and duty mirrored their own and led to great successes in the war against the Death Guard under Typhon. Tactics and Organisation The tactics employed by the Temple Fleet were a variation of Imperial Fist tactics, opening the battle with traditional forces and utilising their expert marksmanship with devastating effect. In defensive fighting, their bolters and heavy bolters would be used to drown their enemy in sheer casualties, slowing down the momentum of their advance. The Guardians of the Temple, often led by Brusilov's inspiring presence, would then counterattack, with Solrite gauntlets and heraldric swords quickly putting their enemies to flight. On the offensive, the order would be reversed, with the Knights of the Temple charging headlong into the enemy, their goal to slay the ranking officers and crush the enemy command structure. These forces would then fall back whilst the Iron Infantry would advance, halting the enemy counter charge with their venerable bolters in determination alone. These tactics would succeed and fail on a case-by-case -case basis. Against the death guard of Typhon, the bolter fire and counter charges reaped a terrible toll on them, with many of the best line infantry of the death guard felled in battle. Conversely, the temple fleet lost many of their most seasoned troops when they tried to strike at the command structure of the Alpha Legion. Their attacks into the heart of the Legion simply led them into repeated ambushes, and the slaying of the Legion commanders seemed to have no impact on the battle. This lesson was hard learned, but few loyalists took it to heart. The fleet is organised into small squads of tactical marines, led by a temple sergeant, who is a junior member of the temple and bears the simple heraldry of the cross, with their weapons often chained in the fashion of the world eaters. Due to their small numbers, junior recon troops are often assigned to the front lines along with tactical marines to support their uncles. As the fleet also contains a not insignificant selection of light ordnance and crew surf weapons, such as heavy bolter rapiers, 
and numerous vehicles with which they bolster their numbers. The majority of their breaches were lost in the conflict and fail, and the few remaining are cautiously employed. The elite elements of the force include large concentrations of Templar brethren, and it is they who form the spear tip of the fleet's infantry assaults, with the few dreadnoughts available often supplementing their strength. Lastly, the command elements of the fleet are led by Praetor Brusilov, with Ramsay, his second, in command and assigned fleet master. Siege breakers and champions make up the majority of the remaining officers, and interestingly, not a single librarian is to be found within the force. A small force of Templar brethren forms the honor guard of Brusilov, and their banner bears the combined heraldry of the numerous companies that compose the original fleet. I now go on to describe one of their notable battles, as this is written in the style of one of the Horus Heresy black books. During the fourth year of the Heresy, the forces of the Temple fleet took part in the defense of the Tunguska system, a trade and supply hub in the galactic northeast. When the forces of the War Master descended on the system, the fleet was orbiting Tunguska IV, the main world of the system, with troops training local defense forces on nearby Tunguska V. The traitor forces under the Emperor's children attacked the forces in overwhelming numbers, pushing them back from the main starports and expertly cutting off the forces of the Temple fleet until only an isolated pocket of 1,500 legionnaires and 130,000 local defense forces were trapped within a small spaceport. The Emperor's children, in their arrogance, sought to amuse themselves with the cruel privations of siege, but they didn't reckon with the Sons of Dawn. Brusilov ordered his fleet master, Berthuil Ramsay, who was assigned to the task of evacuation of the forces trapped on Tunguska V, while well, he himself used his few remaining legionnaires and officers to shore up the defences of Tunguska IV. Ramsay was a more than capable void commander, and he knew better than to risk sending his large warships into low orbit over a traitor-held world. Instead, he marshaled the minor military and civilian ships in the sector, using the stealth and speed of the smaller ships to quickly drop them into the starport, loading up on survivors whilst the planetary defense forces held the line against the traitors. Over the course of the week-long siege, all the Imperial Fist survivors and over 100,000 of the planetary defense forces were successfully evacuated to Tunguska IV. With the fall of Tunguska V, Tunguska IV now became the last line of Imperial defense in the sector. The Temple fleet was held in readiness above the northern polar region, ready to counterattack any traitors who attacked the orbiting defense batteries and docking stations. A large force of civilian and planetary defense monitors and gunboats were also held in low orbit over the southern pole, awaiting assignment and essentially camouflaged from their enemies. The key defense platforms were all held by warriors of the Temple fleet, ready to repel the enemy and if need be, die to the last man. Over the next two weeks, the Emperor's children made skillful feint attacks on the docks and defense platforms, slowly draining their weapons of valuable munitions. When the main attack finally came, it fell upon these very star forts, with the Emperor's children striking for the killing cut. The Emperor's children were precise and methodical, and when counter-attacked by the Knights of the Temple, they gave even the hardened veterans, many taught by Sigismund himself, a hard fight, with equal casualties on both sides. As the forts one by one began to fall, and the Emperor's children moved their fleet to close range, the Temple fleet fell upon them with their warships. The void battle was evenly matched, with the Empress children having to the superior numbers, but inferior quality vessels next to the inward built ships. It was at this moment that the second stage of Brusilov's plan was engaged. The hidden southern fleet, the polar forces were unleashed, and they blazed into battle behind the Empress children fleet. The defense monitors quickly set about the destruction of the purple clad dread cores and transports which are en route between the starships and stations. The Empress children, with their fleet fully committed to the pole at north, were unable now to defend their transports in the equatorial region, as having thought the area successfully overrun, they had not worried with leaving a rearguard, and instead committed their forces fully to the main fleet action. The third stage of the plan was sprung when the civilian ships trailing behind began to land within the remaining star forts. When they touched down, a large force of marines and planetary defense troops, most of whom were recently evacuated from Tunguska V only a few days prior, surged into the forts, quickly laying waste to the traitors. The Emperor's children had thought the battle won, and in their arrogance had let their guard down time and again. Knowing that with the bulk of their legionnaires dead or lost, they could not win the fight, they fled the system. This would not be the last time they would fight the Temple fleet, 
but on the next occasion they would do so with vengeance in mind. So this is something I typed up in about 15 minutes or so. You can tell from the little typos and things like that all through it. <laughs> it's not exactly something I sat down and really well edited. So what are the key points of this story? First is the Imperial Fists. So what are some of the Imperial Fist traits? Very standard Legion tactics, lots of bolt guns, but they do have that uh, hot-headed emotion deep down, as well as a bit of a self-flagellation at failure. So, with this in mind, I've used it to inform why I've picked the Grayon Yellow Scheme, which I picked because I like more than just flat yellow. I think the flat yellow is boring, the grey and yellow works really nicely together. So, I've said, you know what? Self-flagellation, they feel they failed, they failed their Primarch, therefore they don't feel worthy to wear his colours. So, they've stripped themselves back to their pre-Primarch Legion colour scheme. Cool. That's in line with the character of the Imperial Fists. Now, they fight with other Legions, such as the White Scars and the Dark Angel of Causewain. This is because we know both of these forces were uh, on that side of the fight. They were fighting the traitors outside of the Ruin Storm, all throughout the sort of Imperium, fighting guerrilla warfare over the stars over the course of the Horus Heresy. And it makes sense at some points these forces are going to bump into each other. Now the important thing to note here is I don't go for the easy virtue signaling. <laughs> um, what do I mean by that? Well you'll notice a lot of people who make their own characters often point out how they uh, get rewarded or praised by existing major characters. So they'll say, oh, my herald here was handed the banner of the Iron Warriors by the Primarch himself. Well, that doesn't sound very good, does it? It does the person who wrote it, but why is the Primarch going around just handing out banners to your special snowflake dude in your special army? Well, I apply the same principle here. He may have fought with the Dark Angels, he may have fought with the Scars, but it doesn't mean that Lionel Johnson of the Dark Angels comes up personally thanks him for his service. It's dumb and it's over the top, and I think it's something that a lot of people do which is best avoided. Who do they fight in this time? Well, we know that the Death Guard made up a lot of the forces in this region of space. The Word Bearers were off doing their thing, the World Eaters were off doing their thing. Um, both the Word Eaters, uh, World Eaters and the Word Bearers were striking a lot of targets inside the Ruin Storm. Same with the uh, Night Wards, a lot of the forces were trapped in that region. The Empress' children, they've fucked off to the Eye of Terror. The Sons of Horus um, are working their way towards Terror slowly. The Alpha Legion are out infiltrating all over the place. It really just leaves the Death Guard and the Iron Warriors. And since they fought the Iron Warriors at the Battle of Fell, I don't want to have them fighting the Iron Warriors again and again. So I've moved away from that. When it comes to the tactics, I've gone, okay, in the army, the theme I've gone for has a lot of... Templar Brethren, which are a specialist unit in the Horus Heresy for the Imperial Fists. How do I make a, a reason for them being the majority of this army? Well, has about a lot of these soldiers, again in their self-flagellation, with their hot-headedness, have turned more to that close combat route. Instead of all running into battle with bolt guns now, maybe a lot of them choose to run in with a power sword and a combat shield. Why not? So, in order to explain why I've gone for certain choices, I've worked that into their tactics. Okay, they don't have a lot of heavy vehicles anymore because they lost it previous fighting. What did they have? They have a lot of rapiers, they have a lot of heavy bolters, weapons that work really well with the Imperial Fists, and they've got a lot of sword and board dudes, but they don't have the stone gauntlet, they don't have the breaches because they were lost fighting in the void. Makes sense. Do they have a lot of dreadnoughts? No, they have a few Dreadnoughts, and the ones they do have are kitted out for close combat. So these are the points I've been trying to reinforce throughout. Do the tactics always succeed? And here's the biggest thing. No. One of the worst things that people do when they write their own fluff for their own force is say, oh, they win every battle. Well, you shouldn't win every battle. There's got to be a give and take, because if you win every battle, there's never a threat to your forces. Therefore... When fighting the Death Guard, yeah, their tactics work really well. 
they can go for the commanders and kill them and then sort of mob up what's left of the Death Guard. It makes sense. But if you're fighting the Alpha Legion, good luck finding their commander and killing him, right? So, I made a point of saying, when they fought the Death Guard, their standard tactics work pretty well. But when they fight the Alpha Legion, it doesn't work well at all. And they just end up throwing their best and most valuable troops down the throat of the wrong cause. When it comes to my naming conventions, Praetor Brusilov and Ramsay, well, Alexei Brusilov was a Russian general or field marshal in World War I, and probably the greatest general on the Russian side in World War I, probably one of the greatest generals of World War I. Um, because of that, and because we don't use too many Russian names and such, I thought I would include him as a Praetor name. Plus, um, the soldiers of the Imperial Fist coming from the planet Inwit, which is essentially a frozen world. I thought, oh yeah, someone from cold, cold Russia would probably, you know, the name suits. Cold place, right? That's a bit stereotype, but I think it works well. And Ramsay is actually just a slightly changed up version of Ramsay, based on the British Admiral of World War II who helped organise the retreat at Dunkirk. And the retreat at Dunkirk is the main theme for the Tungungaska system, where they were cut off on one planet, evacuated with the small civilian craft, aka the way the British were evacuated with small civilian boats from Dunkirk. So taking an existing story and giving it my own slight twist and explaining why. Well, they don't have many capital ships. They don't want to hover all their Thunderhawks and such over this point. They want to try and draw off the enemy forces. Well, the Legion forces are going to go chasing each other. And if they're chasing each other, then you can go send in the, the civilian aircraft and such. And so that's what Brusilov does. He sends in all these civilian aircraft to go and rescue as many troops as he can. And he doesn't get them all. There are people left behind to hold the positions to the last. And in this case, I've said the local defense forces. But what are they? They're the French. They're the French performing the rearguard action for the British Expeditionary Force. You know, a big thing of real Battle of Dunkirk was the British, you know, they got a lot of French out of there, yes. But the heroism on the behalf of the Frenchmen who stayed behind and held against the Germans from overrunning the town is something that's not really brought up very often. Well, this is an analogy for that. Um, 30,000 local defence forces basically stay behind out of the 130,000 number I picked. Um, with the numbers, 1,500 legionnaires, that's a sizable subfleet, but it's not a huge amount of a legion. When you think that somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to 40,000 troops went to fail, and that you know 1,500 is a sizable chunk of that force, but it's still a rather small force. And after the events of the Tunguska system, there's probably only about a thousand left, realistically. Um, so instead of, I believe it was Bertram Ramsey, was the admiral who planned the Dunkirk evacuation and helped plan the D-Day landings. So I thought that's a great name for a fleet master. So I played on it a little bit, Berthuil Ramsay. Is it too creative on my behalf? No, but I'm just trying to do that same sort of thing that Games Workshop does where they sort of take that real-life characters or real-life names and put a twist on them. Is it great? No, it's probably the weakest part of my story, that the names are so similar, but again, it was just a nod to those historical people who really don't get a, a much of a mention in the history books. Um, your Belisariuses, your Caesars, that sort of thing, they'll get a real nod. You know, your Augustus, um, Richard the Lionheart, these sort of larger-than-life characters. Yeah, they'll, they'll get a nod, but, um, you know, Alexei Brusilov, your Bertram Ramsey, yeah, they don't get much of a, a nod, do they? Uh, your Admiral Andrew Cunningham's. So, yeah, I don't know. They're, they're what I chose. Now, in the actual battle itself, I felt it was very important to point out how skilled the enemy is. Because, again, if your enemy is... It's always good to have it be a narrow-run thing. You don't want your forces to kick the shit out of the other guys. 
because then the other guys look totally incompetent and useless and can't beat you and you do it with ease then it's it just completely deflates the whole thing there's no threat anymore it just becomes a by the numbers whatever oh yeah they're not a threat you can just cake walk through them it's like um like battle droids in star wars if you, if you see a jedi and 30 battle droids are coming at him that's not a threat you know he's going to kill the 30 battle droids right well same sort of thing so i had to make sure that the Emperor's children were skilled in what they did here, and they simply just got outmaneuvered. And that's why they lost this battle. They see that there's an Imperial Fist Fleet, and the Imperial Fist Fleet uh, is above the north of the planet, so the traders chase after them. Ah, oh, we're going to get into point blank range, we're going to kill their fleet. Meanwhile, they're still sending drop craft to keep hitting the stations, thinking that, oh yeah, we've we've won the, we've won the, the void fight over the stations. What they don't expect is a counterattack, that there were hidden ships in the system. So, when writing your own stories, your own fluff, that sort of thing, this is the sort of stuff you've got to keep in mind. If you are going to have your force fight another force, make them competent. Make it so your enemy is as skilled as you are, and that when you beat them, you're lucky to do so. That it could have gone either way. Because if you don't do that, then it, again, it deflates the whole thing. Um, when it comes to, yeah, the naming conventions of characters, it doesn't matter really what you name them. I mean, there are things that are really on the nose, like if you call uh, your commander Augustus Caesar, and he's an ultramarine, and he attacks the planet of Gaulia for, um, defeats uh, the Death Guard being commanded by Vercingetorix <laughs> or something. That's really on the nose. Um, I'd try and avoid that. That's some free advice right there. Um, <laughs> sorry, making myself laugh with the sheer stupidity of it. But I mean, I'm joking and laughing about this right now, but this is the sort of stuff people do right. And that's why I'm making this video to say, try and avoid these pitfalls. Because, I mean, not all the normal rules of story writing apply when it comes to this sort of fan fiction. Let's make some rules up, eh? Let's say, okay, what are the key rules? Uh, tongue in cheek, we like to name characters after existing people from real life history as a bit of a nod and a throwback because people in history have fantastic names. So that's rule one. We name our characters um, in such a way that it hints at real life characters. Uh, rule number two, the enemy should be competent just like you are. Rule number three, don't make your characters special snowflakes who the Primarch himself recognise their virtues and personally award them banners and commands and give them swords from their own personal collection and shit like that. Don't do that because it's cringy as fuck and it becomes a case of you trying to make your guy more special than everyone else's guy and it's not cool, doesn't work, doesn't play well, so let's avoid that. Um, what else? Uh, explain your fluff in such a way that it works with what you do on the tabletop. I have a force here that's all about Templar Brethren. It's got tactical marines, but it's also got a lot of guys who are armed for close combat. So therefore, the actual force I put on the table should be armed with tactical marines and close combat. If I put a fucking force on the table and they're in completely yellow armor, not the yellow and gray, and they're armed mostly with ranged weapons and lots of plasma weapons and there's heaps of breaches and tons of spartan tanks that immediately is completely counter to the fluff that i've created therefore my fluff is bullshit it doesn't actually suit the army uh, if i can give an example there was once a guy um i played up in townsville and he was kind of a friend you know i didn't hate the guy uh, but he was a, definitely a win at all cost player and i said to him once um, after he kicked my ass at another tournament because this guy played some real cheesy lists. Um, and I would win games, but I didn't go super cheesy at all. I'd usually try to keep a theme because I feel themes can be just as strong as cheesy lists. This guy, on the other hand, we're talking 5th edition, late 5th edition, Necron Army with 18 whip coil wraiths and like half a dozen croissants and you know, just just a brutal army to try and fight against in tournaments at the time 
And um, I said to him, you can't build a fluffy list. You just can't do it. It's not in your nature. And he goes, oh, yes, it is. Took me up on the challenge. Comes to the next tournament in 6th edition with a Chaos Army. With two or three Helldrakes, a Baden, Typhus, a squad of Plague Marines, a squad of Noise Marines, um, and a couple of squads of Obliterators. And that was his army. Obliterators of Nurgle by the way, so they were toughness five, or toughness six, sorry, and I'm like, are you fucking for real? <laughs> like, like, your fluff, it's a Chaos Undivided Force, with Abaddon, with Typhus, with multiple Helldrakes, multiple Obliterator squads, Noise Marine squads with Blastmasters, and some Plague Marines, that's your fluffy army, it's literally just a fucking choice selection of the strongest shit in the Codex, <laughs> right, don't, be that guy. Avoid that, okay? <laughs> anyway, um, I hope you like my little story. Please feel free to pick holes in it. Again, I only wrote in about 15 minutes, but for something written in 15 minutes, I think it's, it's okay. It's okay. Um, it needs some refining, some tweaking, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Hopefully these little rules and hints about how I write stories or how I think people should write stories may be helpful to you. Or maybe you found it cringy as fuck and you really didn't like the story. Totally cool with that too. Um, please, thoughts and feedback below and I'll see you all next time.